We're going to go from the free market pencil to uh, health care, which is not quite the free market. How's everybody's temperature, by the way? Comfortable? Good? All right. I'm sure we can either make you hot or cold by the end of the day. Anyway, we hear this all the time. Healthcare is a basic human right, right? We've heard this all, all year long and uh, during this debate on Capitol Hill. In fact, uh, <clears throat> Mark uh, mentioned uh, Mr. Obama, the president, and he stated firmly and without hesitation that health care is a basic human right. And he has plenty of support for this position, um, like another community organizer, Donna Smith, she, uh, she's an organizer, organizer for the California Nurses Association. And she wrote that granting that right is not something to be calculated differently in swing congressional districts, off your strategy, second term presidential term planning. It is your duty to me, to my fellow citizens, and to your nation. Every other developed nation in the world sees health care as one of the obligations of government. But can health care really be a basic human right. Well, we need, to, we need to talk about rights. And there are two types of rights. First, there are positive rights. And positive rights are really just desires that are converted into rights only by employing government to take away other people's property or violate their rights. Those are pro- positive rights. In contrast, we have what's called negative rights. And these are prohibitions laid out against others, especially governments' overwhelming power. We have positive rights, we have negative rights. Now, positive rights to education or housing, health care, uh, provided by or mandated by the government, they require that someone else must pay for them. So the corresponding obligation, therefore, violates other people's negative rights to liberty, by the taking of their property and their income without their consent. So an expansive combination of rights is inconsistent with a more fundamental right to be free. Liberty, of course, means that people rule themselves. And voluntary arrangements are the means to resolving conflicts that we have. But when government assigns positive rights to others, it means that someone else rules over those choices and resources, taken from those forced to pay. However, since no one has the right to rob others, if government is to remain within the narrow range consistent with equal rights, no one can delegate that power to the government. So we can't say that America is the land of the free and the home of the brave if some of us are forced to pay for other people's health care or housing or anything else. So while Nurse Donna is claiming that health care is a basic human right, someone else is going to have to pay and they're going to have to have their rights violated to pay Nurse Donna or Dr. Donna of the world to provide that right. So this right to health care is simply not a legitimate right. The legitimate rights are negative rights. And in this case, people have a right not to be aggressed against, have their property stolen either by individuals or by the government. We have a right to take care of ourselves and to protect ourselves. So we have a right to go seek the health care that we need, but we don't have the right to receive from others health care. Now, I'm not all that old, as much as some of you may think I am, but uh, I remember when doctors actually made house calls. And there's a few in the audience probably remember that. I mean, now you can't get a doctor to make a house call. It it makes sense now, uh, if you get sick, that you should have someone in your household load you up in the car and take you a waiting room to hang around with some other sick people and wait and see the doctor, and, of course, uh, uh, probably get sicker in the process, and, and that's the way the process works. But I remember a day when, back in Abilene, Kansas, where I grew up, that uh, my doctor, Dr. Rohrbaugh, Rocky Rohrbaugh, uh, would charge uh, um, 3 to $4 for a house call. Now, 3 or $4 then is not what 3 or $4 is today, but it's, uh, say, 30 or 40 bucks. Not a bad deal. And what I remember most about doctors back then is doctor's office, how small they were. You'd go in, you'd wait in a waiting room, and then you'd have a little receptionist, and then you'd have um, examination rooms, 
Made perfect sense, right? But now what do doctor's offices have? They have big rooms with lots of files and people on computers. And what are those people doing? They're trying to get paid. They're trying to get the doctor paid. Because for most people, they pay for their health care, not with their own dollars, but with insurance. They make a small little payment, a little copay, and then the rest of the payment uh, for insurance or for the medical procedure is done through those people working in that file room. And uh, it's the same way with medication. Ins- uh, insurance pays for a certain amount, and uh, uh, the, uh, you, you might pay, make a copay but, uh, um, for, for medicine, but uh, insurance picks up the rest. So um, that's the way it is with most people. If you don't have insurance, many people go to the emergency room. They get sick, they go to the emergency room, and the taxpayers pick up the tab. So the price mechanism that uh, Mark was talking about earlier uh, doesn't work in healthcare. The reason it doesn't work is that you, as the consumer who is buying the health care, you don't pay for it. You don't negotiate. The only place you see the price mechanism work in health care is elective surgeries, cosmetic procedures, and then supply and demand move pricing in those areas. But for run-of-the-mill health care, um, you don't drive by a hospital and they have a big sign. You never see a big sign out mo- uh, uh, on the side of the building, appendectomies, 1995 this month. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't, just never happens, right? Uh, pharmacies, uh, now they may discount their milk, they may discount their uh, household goods, but you never see in a pharmacy penicillin half off, right? It, it never happens. So we as consumers shop for the best price and the best service for everything except health care. And why don't we shop for the best price? Well, if someone else is picking up the bill, you're inclined to, are you good, first of all, are you going to be inclined to use more or less of that good? Well, you're going to be inclined to use more of that good, especially if time has, uh, doesn't have much value to you. Now, most of us don't go to the doctor when we don't need to because we don't want to sit around and uh, we don't want to sit around and wait, uh, which um, not only do you get to wait for the doctor, but then he gives you a little piece of paper and you have to go to another building. You have to get back in your car and drive to your pharmacy. And, um, and then you get to wait again for your medicine. Now, you know, people um, are describing this as the free market, but of course it's not. Uh, it needs fixed, but uh, it doesn't need fixed with more government. So, so you might say, well, your examples aren't terribly relevant. I mean, medical care isn't like other goods. I mean, medical care is an emergency, right? Um, if you're sick, you, you need to get well right away. Well, not every, not every medical procedure is an emergency, number one. And number two, I think there's other emergencies out there, like eating and drinking, housing, shelter. These are all emergencies. And here in, you know, about you know, a few minutes, you're going to have those hunger pangs for that Chick-fil-A box lunch. And you're going to say, boy, that's an emergency. I need that. And if we want food, we have all kinds of choices, right? We, we, can, we can go to the grocery store and buy food and cook it ourselves. We can go to restaurants. We can get food any way we want it. Um, same way with housing. You can get housing any way you want it. Where do you want to live? How much do you want to pay? So on and so forth. So price... Quality, convenience, drive those decisions. Now imagine if we got food and housing the way we get health care. I mean, there's no way that you can call health care the way we've been getting it, uh, the free market. So how did this all happen? Well, first, the medical profession was monopolized by the AMA, the American Medical Association, in the early 1900s. What the AMA did was restrict uh, the number of medical schools and who could go to medical school and um, how many doctors were produced. So that's the first thing that happened. And then 10 years later, um, around 1910, there was a national conference calling for universal and social, uh, universal health and social in- insurance. So this started a long time ago in America. But the big change happened during World War II. What happened in World War II is there's a number of, uh, obviously, uh, soldiers uh, drafted to fight um, in Europe and uh, the Pacific, um, this took a number of people out of the workforce, uh, defense contractors. Uh, maybe you've seen uh, the posters of Rosie the Riveter, you know, making planes. 
Um, so a lot of people working for defense contractors. So employers, there was a shortage of labor, and they had to attract uh, people to work for them. Wages were exploding, and what did the government do? Well, they, they placed a ceiling on wages. They had wage controls. So employers uh, couldn't pay uh, more than a certain amount. So if they couldn't pay over a certain amount, what did they do? Well, they offered other perks. The other perk was insurance. And that's why most people um, to this day get their uh, insurance from their employer. This is really no different than banks. When banks used to uh, be restricted by the amount of interest that they paid to attract deposits, they used to give away toasters and other other sorts of small appliances. So as the market tried to deal with government price restrictions or wage restrictions, um, it uh, unleashed this genie out of the bottle that's been with us ever since. And it's, it's really become the custom that if you get a job anywhere, uh, insurance is a, um, is a, a benefit that uh, goes with it. And so the seeds of, of uh, our, our health care um, system were sown a long time ago back during, uh, during World War II. And after World War II, uh, President Harry Truman, uh, in a speech uh, in November 19, 1945, he'd only been president seven months, he said the health of American children, like their education, should be recognized as a definite public responsibility. The right to adequate medical care and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health was part of Truman's Economic Bill of Rights. He said the right to adequate protection from economic fears such as sickness had to be addressed by the government. So he was essentially proposing a national health care um, insurance fund uh, that would be created and run by the federal government. And even the AMA at the time, the American Medical Association, called the bill Socialized Medicine and uh, said that uh, those in the Truman White House were were followers of the Moscow line, party line. So um, despite uh, having lots of support from uh, big labor unions um, and others, Truman was forced to abandon this attempt to um, have the government take over, take over health care. But like most bad ideas hatched in Washington, uh, part of Truman's proposal lived on, and it resurfaced 20 years later. 1965, Lyndon Johnson signed Medicare into law. Medicare provides uh, uh, health care to uh, those uh, over 65. And when Johnson uh, signed the bill into law, he actually selected the Harry S. Truman Library, Independence, Missouri, and he reminded onlookers that Medicare, quote, all started really with the man from Independence, unquote. So in other words, it's taken a long time, about 100 years, to get to, to where we are to this uh, latest iteration of uh, patching together health care in America. Uh, and, even, um, and even under Obamacare, what we have is really not total socialization, uh, but just this uh, trying to patch up this failed system that we have that is not anything like the free market and the price system that, that Mark described uh, earlier. The fact is, 29% of all Americans depend on the federal government for their health care, 29%. And for those over 65, the percentage is 75%. So most people over um, over 65 uh, get their health care provided for by um, by Uncle Sam. And uh, this was brought out recently in these town hall meetings when um, you had a gentleman who uh, who was shouting at his congressman from South Carolina, and he said, "Keep your government hands off my Medicare." And the guy just couldn't be convinced that Medicare already is a government program. So our health care is this, this mixture of private enterprise and regulatory apparatus, subsidies, licenses, controls, patents, monopolies, um, outright welfare, consumption controls. I mean, it's a, it's a system that needs to be fixed, but, but certainly um, but not, uh, not by government. It needs to be, uh, uh, we need more freedom injected into this. Need to have the government peeled away, uh, but that's uh, that's not what's going on. So um, really, we've had experiments in socialized medicine around the world um, for for many many years. In fact, Mises pointed out in, in uh, 1922 that uh, 
whether it's healthcare or any sort of business, uh, without property and market prices, economic rationality disappears. Result is unworkable, it's chaotic, and it's impoverishing. So medical socialism is particularly devastating uh, because of the effects, the capacity for us to stay healthy and alive. It robs us of the rights to exchange and choose. In fact, Mises wrote about um, uh, state-run medical systems. And uh, there, are, there were a few even at the time, and there still are to this day. The Army has its own uh, medical system, and prisons have their own medical system. And uh, these are not centers of health, but of disease and disaster. So if we go back to the beginning of my talk, you remember one of our real rights is the right to seek and obtain uh, medical care through voluntary exchange. And um, this increased socialization will actually destroy that right. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about insurance because we get insurance gets uh, bound up in this discussion. Um, and much of the debate's been about the portability of insurance policies um, and uh, insurance companies not allowing uh, pre-existing conditions, right? You hear this all the time. Uh, people get excluded. They can't buy insurance. Uh, because they have um, some sort of health problem that keeps them from getting insured. And this is unfair and something needs to be done about it. It's the case that's always made. Well, imagine, if you will, that we're not talking about health insurance, but we're talking about casualty insurance, fire insurance. And let's just say you're selling casualty insurance, okay? And you're on the phone one day and you get a call from a guy, and the guy says, listen, I need, um, I need to buy insurance on my house fire insurance on my house. And you go, great, that's great, that's what we're in the business to do. Uh, tell me a little bit about your property. Where's it at? Uh, what's it worth? Is there a lien on the property? Usual things. And then you say, uh, you know, he gives you that information very rapidly. He's in a hurry. You say, uh, we'll insure the house and the policy as soon as you make arrangements for payment and we can go, you know, we can do an inspection of the house. And that'll be maybe later today. And the person says, no, no, I really need the coverage right now. Right now, I gotta have it right now. And you say, well, why are you in a loan closing? Is the lender requiring that you have proof of insurance right away? <coughs> he says, no, my house is on fire. I need to insure it for the full value. Well, that's really what we're talking about with the pre-existing conditions. Is that, um, uh, what people are demanding is that, um, that, uh, the people with burning houses be lumped in the same risk pool as people uh, with houses that aren't on fire. Not only aren't they on fire, uh, they're supposed to be in the same risk pool as uh, houses that might be uh, located next to the to the fire station. So um, it, that's the fallacy of of including uh, those with pre-existing conditions into this uh, into this risk pool. And you know that's maybe. Uh, uh, it's, it's not insurance to do that. They call it insurance, but it's really just a redistribution of assets by government force uh, when you uh, require uh, that the burning houses be thrown in the same risk pool. So um, when you look at it from in those terms, it becomes quite clear, but evidently those in Washington uh, haven't, quite, uh, haven't quite thought about it that way. Um, if, and if you turn things around a little bit, I think a lot of you probably drive in the uh, audience here today, so you have car insurance. In fact, um, the premiums for your car insurance is probably very, pretty high, right? Um, insurance companies have determined that you're a, a riskier pool than the normal younger drivers tend to be uh, less experienced behind the wheel and possibly more, more aggressive, shall we say. So they tend to... Uh, they tend to uh, charge more for that insurance, right? But they uh, lower the premiums if you're a good student and other things like that. And that's what insurers do. They, they assess risk, and there's a, a pool that they throw you, throw you into. And they don't know who is going to have accidents, but they know a certain group of people are going to have an accident. And um, they've determined over time that younger drivers have this accident. But imagine if car insurance was like health insurance, the health insurance we have. It would cover you not only in the case of an accident, it would cover oil changes, tires, you name it. Um, what would happen? Would you, cover, would you use your car more or less? Well, you'd use it more because your insurance is going to cover everything. Uh, it would cover for wear and tear. Um, you'd, you'd be less careful when you drive. And uh, 
And so there would be ramifications if, uh, if car insurance was like the health insurance that we have uh, today. So there are real ways to solve the health care problem. And uh, Hans Hoppe has outlined four simple steps to, to solve, um, solve the problem. And the first thing he would do is, um, is eliminate all licensing requirements for medical schools, hospitals, pharmacies, uh, medical doctors, and healthcare personnel. And he makes the case that uh, the supply would immediately increase, prices would fall, and there'd be a greater variety of healthcare services. And there's been a lot of discussion during this healthcare uh, debate on Capitol Hill that Obamacare um, will actually bring down costs, right? We've heard that. Um, the uh, Office of Budget crunching or whatever they call it and uh, has said that uh, there'll be no effect on the deficit. Well, that's crazy, of course. If you insure more people, if you require people to have insurance, um, they will uh, use uh, the demand for health care will go up. They've not addressed the supply of health care. And thus, uh, the cost of health care is going to continue to increase under the uh, latest proposal. But if we went the HAPA route, uh, we would have uh, a decrease in in cost by eliminating uh, these licensing requirements, and you'd have all kinds of people get into the to the healthcare business. Of course, some people would they um, they freak out about that notion. Well, gee, what? Uh, oh my gosh, my doctor wouldn't uh, wouldn't be certified by uh, by the law. I mean, how we'd all be at risk. Well, I think the first thing you do when you select a doctor is not. Um, you don't call the government and say, gee, uh, give me a list of all the doctors who, who are board certified. Uh, what you do is ask people at work. I know that's the first thing I did when I came to Auburn 18 months ago. I asked the people here at the Institute. I got sick. Who's your doctor? Do you like your guy? Do you like your guy? So on and so forth. And that's how, uh, that's how the market um, would work. Unfortunately, when you have the government, um, Certifying doctors, or, uh, or you, for that matter, if you have the SEC uh, saying that guys like Bernie Madoff are okay, then people think they're okay. They don't do their own due diligence. They don't uh, ask people um, whether uh, either doctors or financial advisors are good. They just take it for granted because the government says it's okay. So um, that's the first thing we would do. We'd eliminate all the licensing requirements. We would also eliminate all government restrictions on the production and sale of pharmaceutical products and medical services. It takes not years, it takes decades to get new drugs approved. And uh, uh, if, if that apparatus was thrown, uh, done away with, costs and prices would fall tremendously. You see this debate all the time. Various states would like to um, have it approved that uh, people could import drugs through the Internet from Canada. And you see it time and time again. They talk about doing it. The drugs are cheaper. Um, but they say, no, wait a minute, that's a health risk. That, you know, if you're trying to get, um, you know, you're trying to get your drugs from, uh, from Canada, there's a health risk. We don't know what's going on up there north of the border. Uh, so we just can't allow that. And you see this all the time. You need to eliminate all those government restrictions. You need to deregulate the health insurance industry would be his next, uh, 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 next solution. We talked about insurance uh, a little bit and how absurd it is that uh, that insurers in the healthcare arena have to insure um, uh, people who are high risk at the same rate as uh, as people who are low risk. Uh, and uh, Hoppe makes the case that uh, you know he he gets thrown in the same pool as say professional football players who who arguably uh, have the uh, a greater propensity to get injured than, say, uh, uh, economics professors. So, so uh, of course, in the case of Hoppe, I'm not sure that's the case. But anyway, um, <laughs> they, uh, obviously, there's two different risk pools, but uh, insurers are not allowed to price uh, people who are, are less risky um, differently than those who present a, a greater risk. Also, he would, uh, and finally, he would eliminate all subsidies to the sick and unhealthy. When you subsidize anything, you get more of it. Subsidize um, the ill and disease, you promote carelessness, indigenous, uh, dependency, and uh, that's what we have. We have with uh, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, we have uh, uh, created this sort of dependency. So there are ways to uh, fix the America's healthcare problem, uh, it is not with more government. Uh, we do have a right 
to seek and choose and pay for the best health care our money can buy. But what we're getting slowly but surely is what the government decides is the health care it believes we should have, and I believe that is the worst possible health care um, that we can have. Thank you.